welcome to the News X Sunday Guardian Roundtable. As we bid goodbye to 2016, we shall be debating today whether this has been the year that has seen the rise of the right wing. What with the win of Donald Trump and of course with Brexit and elsewhere in Europe with Austria, Hungary and also in France. Or I'm wondering whether we should call this the year that has seen the death of the liberal left. For in the Middle East, we've also seen the rise of Arab nationalism. And to discuss all this and also its impact on India, which way has our country turned in the past year? Joining me on the round table, there's Manish Tiwari, Congress spokesperson. There is uh, Rajiv Chandrasekhar, he's the Rajya Sabha MP from the NDA. And Dr. Subramanian Swami, Rajya Sabha MP and BJP leader. Well, Manish, you've seen the global right turn really, but how is it impacting India? Because, you know, in India also we have the BJP and Prime Minister Modi in power. Well, you're absolutely correct that uh, there has been a rise of the right all across the world. Its most virulent manifestation is Europe, where you've seen the exit of Britain from the European Union. Even in France and other parts of uh, Europe, you see the rise of the right. Uh, Donald Trump's victory, despite all the predictions to the contrary, actually uh, underscores it. And in India, uh, in fact, it happened earlier. The fact is that uh, Prime Minister Modi and the BJP won the elections in 2014, much before all this started unfolding. Uh, in Europe and uh, in the United States of America. The reasons may be different. Mm. The reasons in each uh, geographical location may depend upon topical circumstances. But yes, uh, this is a challenge which uh, the left liberal or progressive forces uh, need to recognize and they need to be able to respond to it in a certain manner. Dr. Swami? Well, I think, uh, I mean, he has said one part of it, mm. and it's correct also. The more important part is that the left had become uh, much too sophisticated for the masses. And uh, the, the nuances in, uh, in, in terms of its coverage. Uh, and people began to yearn for straight talk. Uh, and with this media, uh, you know, splurge that is taking place of uh, the uh, social media, etc. Uh, people use the American phrase is tell it, tell us like it is. Mm. And uh, therefore the blunt uh, speakers like, uh, for example, uh, uh, Trump. And by the way, not all the projections were that Trump would lose. I was one of the few and won a few bets also on that, <laughs> uh, who said that Trump would win. Now. That's one aspect that, you know, the, 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 the way you spoke, the, the so-called political correctness which the left imposed, hmm. uh, people began getting fed up uh, and they want, wanted somebody else to tell them something which is straight and which something related to their reality. The second thing is this uh, terror has made uh, macho speaking also a very uh, popular issue. And the left was not articulating that at all. And so both these combinations, in India, of course, I would say there is a growing feeling of a Hindu identity. And it's not articulated. But uh, we benefited by that because our vote went up from 21% to 31% when people rose above the caste. For us, uh, Hindutva means people voting as Hindus, which means rising above the caste. Hmm. So as he says, there are uh, contextual situations. Uh, which have to be taken into account. But broadly speaking, the left idiom became out of date. Uh, people in this modern world of uh, social media and all wanted to be told bluntly, straight, what they, what, what they, what they can do, cannot do. And the third is terrorism uh, made the room possible for macho speaking, which the right was doing. Are your first thoughts on this? No, so so I have a problem with uh, this definite the the characterization of right because I don't know what in what context are we talking about right? Is it right wing economics? Is it right wing identity politics? Is it right wing uh, approach towards uh, law and order and terrorism? So we have to be careful that we don't put all of it in one bucket and say. India's right-wing uh, move is the same as the American right-wing move, as the same as the UK right-wing move. But there is one common theme that I see uh, as I travel around the world and in India, hmm. which is that there is a growing, growing realization of a certain kind of national identity politics. The Americans are saying, we want America great again. Hmm. The English are saying, or Britain is saying, 
we don't want to lose our national identity in this little uh, you know uh, yeah soup of uh, european union mm. so i think clearly whether you disagree on or agree on the national uh, right wing economics or the, uh, the hard approach to terror there is a growing pushback from the old humanitarian free migration model to more and more of a conscious deliberation of national identity mm. who are we as americans who are we as indians who are we as british and that i don't think is particularly a bad thing i think because years and years of political correctness have created a very very dangerous situation in europe uh, you know and it is creating social friction i'm not anti immigration mm. but i think there is a clear pushback to decades of this left liberal humanitarian approach towards uh, growing societies and growing countries to something that says this is our national identity and we want to preserve that culture and heritage and we'll see what else comes with that see in this scenario manish is the congress worried because the bjp you know whatever they have a very strong sense whether they call it hindutva hinduism they have a strong sense of national identity congress is still walking the you know the center line <coughs> well, i think let's forget the congress and the bjp for a while because uh, for the first time you are having something which is far more substantive in terms of a discussion than the usual tutu me me which goes on <laughs> you know let me i just wanted to take uh, rajiv's point you see the lurch to the right hmm. is both social it's economic and it is political so therefore it's not as if uh, there is only a right wing economic orientation there's been a fundamental shift of the axis to the right and if people do not uh, acknowledge it they live in denial that's number 1 and number 2 you know there is this very interesting contradiction so on one hand you have uh sovereign boundaries or westphalian boundaries getting erased mm. by the by the facebook lands by the twitter lands of the world you know today there is talk of actually even virtual sovereignty countries existing in the in the, in the virtual space mm. and then you have the hardening of attitudes towards the westphalian construct the so called national identity which i think uh, britain exit from um, the european union exemplified it the most so there is a very interesting contradiction that while technology is blurring those barriers mm. you know there seems to be a human instinct you know to hold on to what uh, they feel possibly more secure with and this contradiction as it plays out over the next uh, a decade or so will be something very interesting to watch yeah but see i i hmm. he's substantially right hmm. but uh, the economic aspect it's a very peculiar uh, situation both right right and left today are more or less for market economy now but the left is for globalization and the right is for protectionism i, I don't mean communists when i say left i mean the uh, or the uh, 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 yeah or the kind of people you see in uh, uh in, in, in delhi no <laughs> yes in his De- in, in delhi in his party the national uh, what uh, advisory council or something you had uh, full of uh, people who are okay. left mm-hmm. and there's all these uh, uh questions of uh, manrega and uh, so on mm-hmm. and the attitude towards uh, minorities uh, all these are uh, were the ones really that distinguish i think it's a uh, much more the right movement is much more a social cultural thing than an economic thing but in the economics part rajiv the social uh, you know the welfare state uh, concept is also something that is adopted by the right isn't it maybe in a more no, so that is the point way. i was making ah. I, uh, and i agree with both uh, my friends that the move to the right is essentially political social and cultural and not That's economic right, hmm. right. Okay. and because the welfare state under for example the so called right government that you call prime minister modi hmm. has actually expanded it has not uh, it has not contracted with jandan yojana and all of that okay. so the the real move is triggered by the issue of identity and here i would disagree with manish actually technology is helping amplify this move to identity identity in a sense realization it is easier for people all across the world to come on facebook or come on a social media platform and say this is our identity and suddenly you will have 10 million people of the same identity talking the same language mm. now in a flash you can have let's say all americans who believe that america needs to be more isolationist more uh, anti immigration can just come together on a platform and say this is what we want similarly for in india if a certain community caste or a na- or an identity 
for example, the national anthem debate. Hmm. You will have a whole bunch of people coming in and saying, we want the national anthem to be sung. Hmm. And it is really then the onus is on the left liberal, liberal to say, no, 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 we don't want this imposed on us. So I think technology has, in a sense, amplified this as, and he, has helped the rise of the right and has helped this transformation away from the left liberal discourse to what we are seeing today in US, in, in Britain and in India. I may just uh, add something. See, you asked him about the Congress uh, hmm. problem. Congress so far strategy was very useful to them so far. That is, divide the Hindus and unite the minorities. Hmm. Now this identity thing which he correctly identified has sort of started consolidating the Hindus and uh, minorities, whether they the minorities. I don't know, Shias have been divided up. You know, this time, Boras, Khojas, we managed to divide their vote. Hmm. Women is another factor, hmm. which is we find increasingly support from Muslim women. So they, they, they have to address this strategy. Hmm. They don't have come as well as far as us to meet that. But they at least should go where Patel was or Moraji Desai was, you know, who were known as strong Hindus. Mm. And yet, you know, they could articulate uh, their own Congress ideology. Unless they do that, if you have a foreign look, outlook of your party, and, uh, you know, people all in suit boots, uh, and... Uh, He's calling yours the suit boots, Sarkar. I, uh, no, he can call suit boots, Sarkar. It, doesn't, it applies to only one individual in our party. There I would like to respectfully disagree with Dr. Swami. See, the Congress never divided the Hindu society. If the Hindu society was divided by anybody in terms of an extreme intrin internal intrinsic churning, it mm. was by Vishwanath Pratap Singh. It was Mandal which actually... He's a congressman. Which may have been a congressman, but when he did it, he did it with the support of the BJP mm. and, the, and, 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 and the communists. So therefore, the National <laughs> Front government had nothing to do with the Congress party. It had everything to do with you or your current avatar and the left. So therefore, the, mm. the, the, the big churn mm. which stratified Hindu society into caste actually was done by Prime Minister V.P. Singh and not the Congress party. Number two, Dr. Swami is right. There is a certain idea of India which the Congress Party has. Hmm. And that idea of India is that democracy is not about only listening to the majority. But democracy is also about giving the minority an equal space, a minority point of view also an equal space. Unfortunately, what has happened, and there, you know, I take what uh, Rajiv is saying, that you, the, 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 the mobilization aspect of the social media tools have now, has now allowed the dominant majority voice to completely drown out the minority voices. Now, the difficulty with that is that in a country as heterogeneous as India, mm. if you drown out the minority voice, you push them into a corner and from alienation, you go to radicalization and you go to extremism. One of its biggest manifestations is unfortunately in Kashmir. For the life of me, nobody has been able to explain to me why is Burhan Vani the poster boy of the young Kashmiri? Why isn't that, isn't that, that boy who came second in the civil service exam? So therefore, you see, here lies the danger of identity politics in a heterogeneous country like India, that if the minorities actually get pushed to the wall, rather than being included into the mainstream, you have a huge problem. And if you look at sheer numbers, hmm. you see, minority numbers in India are not really mini school numbers. They may be characterized as a minority, but they're large numbers. And therefore, I think we need to be cognizant of that reality. I think here Manish is making a mistake. I think this is not a zero sum game yeah. where uh, listening to the majority and accepting that the majority is in majority automatically implies that the minority is ignored. That, that is not how I, I see it being played out. I think for several years and decades, in the, in the anxiety to, in a sense, not alienate the minority, the majority was alienated and wasn't heard as much. And that clock has now turned full circle, come to a situation where the majority, whether it's in India, whether it's in Britain, whether it's in the US, is saying, that's all fine, but we are the majority and we want to be heard and we want to also have a voice in how this narrative moves forward.
that doesn't automatically imply that everybody who's a minority is going to go take up arms and become radicalized. That is the narrative, unfortunately, that has been in play for too long, mm. which is to fear, scare the hell out of everybody, that if you accept that there is a minor majority national identity of a nation, suddenly everybody else is going to get hurt, upset, and take to arms. That is not what a mature democracy is about. That America has shown that, Britain is showing that, and France will show that soon, which is that there is a core identity of a nation that cannot be ignored. That is the majority identity, or whatever you want to call it. Hmm. And the other part of it is a plus-plus add-on. But to assume that the minority identity has to be treated with such kid gloves that the majority will constantly feel ostracized, ignored, is a recipe that has created this move to the right. Well, before yeah. Dr. Swami yeah. comes in, may I, may I yeah. just, Dr. Swami, for a second? You know, <coughs> the fact is that I would like to respectfully disagree with this conceptually because when you go back to the partition of India, that is where the idea of India was founded. Hmm. So therefore, you created an Islamic Pakistan and you created a secular state of India where there was no majority or minority identity. There was only an Indian identity. Now, if, if after 67 years, you are going to superimpose a Hindu identity onto that idea of India, I think you are creating a problem. No, I didn't say Hindu identity. I said there is a national identity. I think people are saying a national identity of a nation like India will obviously be driven by what the nation consists of. Not well, now you're being politically correct. No, 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 no. I'm being factually <laughs> correct. Yeah. Okay, much to my surprise, we have to take a break. But stay with us. This is a fascinating conversation to be a part of after a short break. to the news at Sunday Guardian Roundtable. We are here discussing the right turn taken by the world in this year and also the impact in India and also the idea of India, I think, which is where Dr. Swami wanted to come in. Well, I'll start uh, with his comment okay. that uh, the partition uh, uh, created uh, a Muslim uh, Pakistan. Pakistan and a secular India. Well, if you read, uh, I urge him to go back and read the uh, parliamentary debate in the House of Commons when they're debating the Indian Independence Act. They said our intention is to create a Muslim Pakistan, Muslim governed Pakistan and a Hindu governed India. And it is our Congress party leaders of that time who said, no, uh, we will not ask anyone to leave. Although Ambedkar was in favor of a population exchange. And anyway, it couldn't be debated because Mountbatten uh, advanced the date of uh, independence to August. Uh, 47 instead of June 48. Now, secondly, please don't use the word minorities to describe everybody because I think at the core of your mind is that minority means Muslim. Mm. Parsis are a minority, the smallest minority. They are the ones who should be most afraid of being destroyed. They are essentially a part of our society. Okay, the, the Jews are very small, no problem. Jains, Buddhists, Sikhs. Sikhs now, uh, mm. uh, and Syrian Christians definitely, and except the these missionary uh, targeted Christians, uh, all of them have no problem. Furthermore, as far as the Hindu right is concerned, we have told the Muslim population that you are also part of us, because your DNA is the same as us. It's the mullahs who say no, that's not true, we come from Arab. The problem with the Muslim community is its identity with the Arab invaders. That is where the problem is. You know, again, <clears throat> there is a fundamental conceptual disagreement that I have with Dr. Swami. You see, when you look at minorities in India, minorities in India constitutionally are counted state-wise. Mm. For example, I am a Hindu, but I am a minority in Punjab. And the Hindus electorally in Punjab behave in the same manner as minorities do in any other part of the country. So therefore, when I talk of a minority. I'm not talking of a Muslim minority. I'm talking about myself as a minority in a Sikh-dominated state of, of Punjab. So, 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 therefore... I hope this is publicized in Punjab. <laughs> well, well, please do, because my mother is a Jat Sikh, so therefore I have no difficulty with that. But all I'm trying to say is, you see, when I speak about driving the minority into a certain corner, 
it is not uh, scare mongering or it is not rumor mongering or it is not like to uh, to, to pander to any fears mm. the fact is that there is a certain minority character in a majority dominated ethos and till the time in a secular state or in a pluralistic mm. state you do not take special care of the little interests you really do not evolve and develop as a country you started this no, minority no, no, conversation I, 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 have, I again have a problem with the special care because the, unless <coughs> you start defining words like special mm. care uh, they are concerned they are worried you know that just opens up the whole uh, opportunity to pander hmm. in my opinion we are a secular nation we are a nation with a constitution and my majority minority whichever religion the rule of law and functioning institutions are the best protection for all indians whether the indian is a muslim whether the indian is a christian the, the, the indian is a hindu hmm. Now your topic in this conversation is why have we moved to the right? Yeah. So I think leave that issue of concerns and fears aside because that is an issue of you know uh, people and institutions of the government functioning to protect all citizens equally. But the real reason for the mo rise of the right or the rise of the right discourse is that people are fed up with this protect. decade old left liberal and I, I'm not saying left liberal to knock the left but mm. left liberal humanitarian driven conversation that excludes a large part of uh, india and the us and the britain out of a conversation we can't all be constantly spending our lives worrying about somebody we have to worry about the nation national identity is an important issue and yes within the national identity discourse we should also ensure that there is room for those who believe that they are not in the majority and i'll just make one last point on the national anthem is an example mm -hmm. for all of the hue and cry in delhi about the supreme court order on the national anthem in an audience of let's say 400 people watching a movie two people will say we will not stand up but the other 398 will stand up willingly proudly but should do you say that the other 398 people should not have the right or the the pleasure or the satisfaction of having the national anthem every, uh, every before just because two people are majority the, uh, yeah. wins that is right no before he responds no on an issue say. of national national identity okay first of all minority is not defined in the constitution correct it is only a constitutional uh, bench hmm. yeah uh, second here uh, the hindu grievance comes out very clearly we have minorities in karnataka uh maharashtra etc but the moment you go to jammu kashmir mm. no, the know. hindus are not a minority they are not given any status of a minority not given status uh, in punjab it's a linguistic minority it's, but uh, sikhs it's came out of demographic here. minority no, also huh? it's a demographic minority no, also I, I mean, uh, it's all right but it's just a linguistic minority huh. and uh, it was never there hmm. the sikhs were founded to save the hindus and uh, guru tegh bahadur and Govind Singh. In fact, you know what they did was how we are still Hindus. So I, uh, I, I think that's that's not a serious problem. The real problem is that, and Christians are so small, it's not a serious problem. The Islamic invasion of India is a memory etched in our in the majority. It's a continuing civilization. Even the UNESCO accepts that we are a continuing civilization. So uh, where the issue comes is. where the muslims are specially targeted and they in this modern context of international uh, islamic terrorism is a problem and therefore the muslims have to make a uh, a special effort to say we are also part of india not as a holder of passport but that we are from this country okay. we are not yeah. <coughs> uh, quickly no on, no 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 on, on the national anthem you know i entirely agree with the, what rajiv says see the national anthem is a secular national identity hmm. and i don't think any indian should have a problem with that irrespective of what his caste community religion is so therefore those i think